Hey, y'all. Welcome to part two of our conversation with our amazing speaker on the Do the Change podcast. We're going to hop right back into the conversation. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spotify page, and follow us on Instagram at Do the Change podcast. Um, you know, Black physicians couldn't even have membership into the American Medical Association. Yep. Um, so post-civil rights, and that was what ended up, you know, having uh, leading to the creation of the National Medical Association, which was a uh, organization that allowed, um, you know, Black folks to be able to have membership in regards to larger, um, you know, uh, access to resources, networking, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and the AMA is like the, you know, the, you know, uh, national yeah. institute in terms of membership um, for physicians and representation for physicians in regards to, the, you know, the field and being the standard for the field and mm-hmm. setting the standard for so many things in the field, right? Um, and so, you know, the United States history of racism, um, you know, has left long-lasting impacts. Um, and, you know, I, earlier I was talking about the social determinants of health, and, you know, you look at it in terms of the present day. So we have less offerings in terms of programs that are in the communities in which Black and brown people live. Um, and... Um, if we just, you know, really hone in on the microscope and if we're, you know, within the same understanding that the United States has a history of racism, imperialism, and colonialism that disproportionately impacts um, Black, Brown, Indigenous people, um, you know, what that looks like, you know, on the individual and community level is under resource and um you know, or a disproportionate amount of under-resourced um, communities in which you have um, folks who, you know, students who are, you know, sometimes the first in their family to be the ones who go to college and having to navigate, um, you know, the pre-med route by themselves, right? right. Um, you know, they don't have the benefit of having like a mom or a dad or uncle or aunt or cousin, sibling who had already gone to medical school that they could just ask, or they might not have mentorship or even know a doctor in their area to give them that guidance, right? Um, yeah. You know, may not always get to participate in programs that, you know, help lay those things out or, you know, receive good counseling. Um, and, you know, one of the things that comes to mind, at least for me personally, you know, because that was definitely um, something I had faced when I had first stepped into um, LMU, but also we speak about it from the financial perspective. There are a lot of financial barriers in terms of the application process itself um, that yeah. often, you know, prevents uh, students of color from applying immediately. Uh, because they have to take into consideration um, whether it be um, uh, whether it be in regards to um, you know them not wanting to take on more debt and wanting to start working so they can immediately start helping their family, um, mm-hmm. or in terms of just being ready to handle all the expenses that come along with the application cycle because you have to pay you know a couple hundred dollars to take the MCAT. Um, And then, you know, to properly study for the MCAT, you need to pay a couple hundred dollars just to, you know, buy books and, um, you know, equipment, uh, well, not equipment, software to help you study for the exam. And then, um, you know, um, for for students who are, um, you know, low income, there are fee assistance waivers that help in terms of some of these things, which is really great. Um, But if you're, you know, coming um, you know, and that helps in terms of like, um, like I think up to 15, oh, oh, like for applying up to 15 schools or something along the lines of that. Yep. Yeah, um, yeah. But if you don't meet that requirement and it's a narrow requirement, then you're going to be, you know, often the one responsible in terms of funding your education, um, you know, because if your family has other debts, um, you know, or, you know, there's just not a lot of disposable income, then, um, you know, often like students of color or uh, underrepresented students are usually the ones that are funding the application process for themselves. And that's what ended up happening with me. Um, mm-hmm. Even while I was at LMU, we were talking about um, students and uh, there being differences and disparities in terms of GPA or MCAT. Yep. Um, you know, typically when it comes to um, uh, Black and Latinx students, they typically um, you know, uh, the trend, um, comparative to their, um, if we're talking specifically black students and typically in terms of their non-black counterparts is that black students are typically, um, you know, have lower GPAs or, um, lower MCAT scores comparatively. 
Um, but if you take into context, again, like the history and you take into the context, the impact of, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, systemic racism um, mm-hmm. and students having to navigate that as students who are also still responsible to their families and communities. Like I had to work like three to four jobs, like, you know, like during the year just to be able to like maintain and help pay for my ever increasing tuition or, you know, ah. to be able to, um, you know, pay for like my car, you know, um, insurance or like, um, you know, to have money, you know, available so I could take care of my own education so I didn't have to worry or concern my family about, you know, the cost of books or things like that. And um, when I was going through the cycle specifically, it was like, yeah, I had to like, you know, also be the one to like fund my education. And so I had to fundraise. Um, and that was because, you know, in terms of like paying off debt and, you know, trying to help, you know, um, support, you know, the people I care about in my life, those, those things also took priority. Um, yes. and so, you know, you could also talk about it in terms of like the biases, um, that, you know, some might fix, uh, in the admissions process as well, but I, I felt like that's a, a slippery slope and a deeper conversation Very slippery. too. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that could be a whole but, separate episode on biases in medical school <laughs> and that is yes yeah you you hit it right on the head <laughs> yeah but but yeah these are some of the barriers that students of color face um and that black students face specifically um and you know it's not easy it's not um you know um fully equitable um, but there are people who are out there doing the work to try and, you know, um, provide opportunity and bridge the gap, whether it be through pathways programs or mentorship programs, um, whether it be through, um, you know, programs that help give students stipends to handle the cost yeah. of the application cycle, which I was able to participate in and benefit from, mm-hmm. which was a huge blessing. Um, but yeah, the gaps are still there for sure. It's very, very expensive. You know what? It's like, it's like you read my mind. So I was going to ask you, like, so what were some mentorship programs or like funding opportunities that you, because um, you'd mentioned a little bit about some of the funding opportunities and the um, like mentorship programs that you participated in or heard of um, just for folks who are maybe kind of in the same boat or know someone who's in the same boat and they're just trying to figure it out. Um, do you, I guess, off the top of your head, do you know of any that you feel or have had positive experiences with or heard positive stories about um, for folks who are looking to get into the medical field? Yeah, definitely. Um, I would say one that really stands out um, is pretty well known, I think, is the Summer Health Professions Education Program, uh, the shorthand for the acronym is SHPEP. And it's a national program that has um, summer pathway um, initiatives across the U.S. at, you know, major schools like UCLA, Mm. um, Howard has one as well. And it's a six-week summer program for students who are, um, I believe, freshmen to sophomores and sophomores to juniors. And... (laughs) Uh, it's a paid stipend program uh, in which, you know, students are able to gain, um, you know, academic enrichment and, you know, be exposed to study skills that help them prepare for the MCAT and some of the prereq courses that they need to take. Um, you know, they get mentorship and, you know, participate in programs that are focused on uh, giving um, or, um, you know, or, or exposed to curriculum rather that are focused on, you know, basically making extremely clear what the route to medical school is and, you know, supportive guidance and advising to help those students get to where they need to go. Um, So that's one I definitely recommend that folks look into. Um, Another is a program that has helped me a ton was uh, Health Career Connections or HCC. And they are a national nonprofit that helped underrepresented and underserved students get internships within the health professions. And Mm -hmm. so it's across health fields and health practices. So that's this actually is an internship that isn't just for pre-meds. And it's not even just, and and actually that's not even the focus of the the org. It's for the allied health professions as a whole. Uh, But pre-meds get a lot from participating in health career connections specifically because they have a lot of placements that are at hospitals um, and they have a lot of placements that are 
um, you know, tied to health centers, whether they be community, uh, like federally qualified community health centers, or whether they be, um, you know, community nonprofits that do work with doctors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so that, I participated in that program twice, and that actually um, got me my job at Kaiser, um, oh. because I had it. Yeah, yeah, because I had okay. got in, um, mm-hmm, yep, yep, and so I had um, got in the internship after my interview, and once I finished my internship, um, I, you know, I made a good impression on the then associate dean of the office and, um, you know, a, um, you know, one of my mentors, Dr. Walter Conwell, um, and so he, you know, advocated for me and helped me um, become part of the team based on my performance during the internship. Um, and so they do a lot of really, really, really great work. And they also started this new initiative. It's a um, medical careers coalition. And so it's a um, program that, you know, there's like monthly meetings in which folks are able to network with med students and other professionals. And it's to help support students in their application journey and cycle, um, which is really, really helpful. Um, the last one that I would mention is another amazing organization and nonprofit called Me Mentor. Mm -hmm. um, and so Me Mentor uh, is a prof nonprofit that is specifically dedicated to supporting underrepresented and underserved students get into, um, you know, medical school. And so they have um, a bunch of webinars and workshops and host conferences that are, you know, supportive of undergraduate students recent graduates. Um, they're even working on initiatives for community college. Um, and, you know, they specifically help connect uh, students to physician mentors and medical student mentors. Uh, but they also uh, have a really great program. They have two really great programs. One is called the Medical Series Ready, or Medical School Ready Program, MSR. And MSR is a year-long program in which they help um, support you via every step of the application cycle, working on your personal statement, working on your secondaries, working on, um, you know, uh, your interview skills. Um, and then they actually, um, you know, along all the way up until when you apply, support you in terms of refining your application. Um, so that, it's, uh, you know, uh, excellent by the time you're ready to go through the cycle. Um, yeah. And then they most recently just started an in, a summer internship. I think it's the Health Equity Fellows Internship um, in which, um, and this is based in Southern California specifically, um, but uh, to which I'm aware, um, mm -hmm. but it's a program in which students are able to get a clinical experience um, for a six week internship, uh, which is really, really great too. Um, so, yeah, those are the ones that come to mind um, as of now. But if there's more, I can send them to you and you could like maybe list them in the description. Oh, totally. Yeah, I think I'm really sad that we have to <laughs> that it's coming to the end of this conversation because I feel like you just dropped not only a lot of gems in regards to like your own like experience and how you navigated through things, but then also like plugging other organizations and also plugging us into the history um of uh, one medical school and like the history of why <laughs> we see these like disparities and I think that even for me like I thought my understanding I I just realized that in this conversation that I learned that it's like no it's higher it's actually two steps deeper um as to why we're seeing these things and I think that that gives a lot of context in regards to why certain HBCUs have like medical schools and how that happened. Um, I think sometimes, especially now you just look at it as like, oh, these are the schools that have it. But it's like, no, actually there are probably more HBCUs that had it and it was actually removed because of a set standard a sta or the standardization of medical schools, which I had no, um, I didn't know the history of the standardization. So I think that yeah, I think that's probably why I'm really sad. I'm like, Keen, it's like an uh, like a black encyclopedia, and I'm here for it, um, <laughs> in like the best way possible. Like it's like it's, it's like um, in a good way, and like and it just I, I think I, no, I love it. Yeah, and and I think that I'm very glad that you're going to be a doctor because I feel that in addition to taking care of your patients in the most traditional understanding of that, but I think that there is something 
to be said about a doctor who also just like is like a wealth of knowledge. So I think your patients are going to leave um, healed in two different ways, like healed in regards to whatever injury they're coming in for, then also healed of like, okay, like actually I'm also empowered myself, you know, because of what, whatever mm -hmm. knowledge you share. And um, that's really awesome to see and experience. And also just, it's just crazy. But I'm, yeah, I really sat down this part. I think I've said that three times. So I am really sat down this conversation. So I first want to just thank you for being open and honest and very clear and direct just about the history of these institutions, also about how you got to where you got to. Um, and yeah, and so I also just want to end on a positive note in regards to self-care and any closing thoughts and advice you want to have uh, or you want to bestow on us as listeners. Um, so my first conversation or my first question, not conversation, because it could be a conversation. <laughs> you got it. You got it. Of like, it. how do you handle burnout or moments of feeling overwhelmed? Um, especially as a person of color and also being a scholar and also just being just McKean, everyday McKean. So like how do you um handle burnout? I think that's a great question because I have definitely had to deal with burnout throughout my life. Um, mm -hmm. or I would say throughout my adult life. Um, and the way in which I handle burnout nowadays is really making it a priority for me to invest in the things that um, fill my well. Yeah. Um, and so, um, you know, what I mean by, you know, filling, you know, filling the well is, doing things that make me feel whole, doing things that I enjoy, that help me, um, you know, appreciate and find the beauty in, and uh, in terms of life, um, the things that help me feel connected to community, the things that help me feel grounded in understanding what my purpose is in terms of how I want to go about my career and supporting the folks that I care about. Um, but yeah, really emphasizing, you know, in terms of the like, things that I enjoy. So, um, you know, um, uh, like a big, you know, I'm a big fan of poetry. So, you know, in terms of reading books and going to open mics and, you know, connecting the people Plug your on book, that Bikini. Level. Sorry to interrupt. Plug your book. <laughs> Go ahead. Plug the book. Y'all, McKean so has a book. <laughs> so I have a book. Uh, and it is called Lay Me Down by the Water. Um, and it was a project that I released last year that I actually plan on re-releasing this summer. Uh, stay tuned. Um, but um, yeah, it, you know, um, it's going to be on um, a self, a, it's a self-published book, but it's going to be on Barnes and Noble's website so people can find it there. It's, again, it's called Lay Me Down by the Water. You can just like search in my name. You should be able to find it. Mm -hmm. um and you can also mm -hmm. find it on my instagram page um as well in terms of my link tree so at um mckean underscore yasar hopefully the spelling of my name is included in other things it's, yes um, it will. it's gonna be everywhere you got it <laughs> but you know even like the creation of that book was extremely healing for me and making time um you know to work on that was something that was helpful and then you know, making time to do nothing is huge, right? Like um, purposely leaving um, white space in my calendar and not having it be filled in terms of trying to be my most productive self at every given moment. Um, and, you know, giving myself grace to, um, you know, be more present, um, you know, stopping, you know, where to lay me down by the water, but going to the water, going to the beach or going to a park or, you know, catching up with someone who I hadn't talked to in a while. Yeah. Spending time with like, um, like these are all things that help fill my well. And those are the things that help me recover so I could be my best self. Um, mm -hmm. Especially in a society in which, you know, we have, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, based on, you know, the capitalistic grind, um, you know, a work culture and an environment that, it, you know, doesn't allow us, um, you know, uh, you know, space for rest and creates a overhanging cloud of anxieties in terms of having to try and, you know, progress my career at this certain rate or, you know, need to handle my material needs in terms of, um, you know, rent and food, and oh, if I don't do A, B, C, or D, you know, like, um, you know, will I be able to meet these needs? And, you know, um, do I deserve 
to be able to rest? And the answer is always yes, you do. Yeah. Um, and um, to go at your own pace and not let the pace of others' expectations or your own unrealistic expectations influenced by, again, that grind um, based on the, the culture of, um, you know, the work culture that can constantly makes us feel like we have to do more and more. Um, but if you don't do for yourself, you can't even show up as your best self in those spaces. And so I know I'm much more useful to my community and the people that I care about if I'm coming, you know, um, into spaces, um, you know, um, not feeling burnt out, right? Yeah. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that, um, you know, and working out, um, I recently found like a love and passion for working out again, which is great because I used to, there was a period of time where I played sports in high school. Like I played basketball and volleyball and basketball yeah. specifically, like we would always run as punishment. And so I just got like, I ended up hating working out after like I went to college and stuff like that. But I think um, now it's become very meditative and grounding for me. Mm. Um, so I do a lot of like strength training and, um, you know, I play basketball again for fun. Uh, yeah. We found a love for the game. And, you know, I think the mindset shift that helped a lot was like, okay, I'm not doing this because I'm trying to win a championship. I'm not doing this, you know, to try and look a certain way, you know, like my reasons and purpose for doing this is so that I could, um, you know, feel better about my mental to, you know, so I could, um, you know, feel more healthy to be less winded going upstairs so that I could carry boxes when it's time for me to move. Cause I always seem like I have mm. to move a lot. <laughs> and, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, you know, cause in, and in the future, like, so I could be able to play with my kids and be able yeah. to, um, you know, be, um, you know, present, you know, for, for my family and the people I love in my life. And, um, you know, so that mind shift in terms of like, you know, the purpose of why I work out has helped a lot in terms of me being more consistent with it. Yeah. Um, maybe I need to adopt that mindset because me, me and working out is still be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now I'm thinking about it, I'm like you know what that's a really good approach of kind of like almost I don't say reparenting yourself but kind of like re yeah I guess like re reparenting your love for um like just working out or just being active in any way it's really cool um yeah so before I close out do you have any parting thoughts or parting advice um for those who are coming into the field or just in general folks who are um, trying to make a change in any way? Um, I think I do. I think I want to leave on a quote. Um, okay. And I have, um, let's see. Do, do, do. Scroll, 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 scroll. It is, I'll leave with two quotes. I'll leave with two quotes. The first okay. one I'll leave with, is a Toni Morrison quote. Um, so this is an allusion to like, um, well, not an allusion to, but in reference to me talking about, you know, very heavy history in terms of, you know, the reason why we have, you know, fewer, um, you know, HBCU medical programs and, you know, speaking about, um, you know, some, you know, the oppression, you know, faced by folks in our uh, community in regards to the Watts Rebellions. Um, you know, this Toni Morrison quote is kind of focused on um, you know, understanding the need for us to be collectively tied and supportive of one another, um, understanding the things that we've been through. And so the quote goes, our past is bleak, our future dim, but I am not reasonable. A reasonable man adjusts to his environment. An unreasonable man does not. All progress, therefore, depends on the unreasonable man. I refuse the prison of I and choose the open spaces of we. And I really love that quote um, because it speaks to an understanding that for a lot of the rights or, um, you know, experiences that we have today, um, you know, these things were once considered to be unreasonable to those who were in positions of power. Um, and, you know, if we were talking about, um, you know, some of the things that were resultant of the civil rights movement, if we're talking mm -hmm. about, um, you know, things as simple as the Voting Rights Act or the Housing Rights Act and just these simple understandings and thoughts in terms of, you know, 
um, black people and people of color also deserving to have equal access to healthcare, having equal access to be able um, to have housing in certain neighborhoods, to not, you know, be barred from living in certain communities, right? These mm-hmm. are one things that were considered unreasonable by folks who were maintaining, um, you know, the uh, power differential in regards to um, yep. maintaining white supremacy and maintaining class hierarchy, right? And these are now things that we exist with and understand as, you know, straightforward rights. Now, those who want to maintain power, um, you know, uh, you know, give an example of like, um, like DeSantis in Florida or whatever have you, um, you oh, know, yeah. they, you like, you know, there are still folks who disagree with those things, but the ma- large majority of folks understand that these are things that folks should have, that everyone deserves, right? right. Um, and so it takes being at times unreasonable um, or what folks deem to be unreasonable to be able to dream up new ways of being and to be able to fight for, you know, um, you know, environments that are more equitable. Um, and that is always something worth doing, right? Yeah. Um, as, you know, to help, you know, um, you know, to liberate oneself and to help, you know, lift off the food, lift off the foot of someone else's back is some, is in of itself liberating, right? For yourself right. too. Um, and so I really love that quote. I think about that quote a lot. And then the last quote that I'll leave off on is in terms of a simple quote. Um, it's uh, a quote from uh, an amazing, um, uh, 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 she's a, she is an amazing organizer, a transformative justice organizer. And um, her name is Maryam Kaba. And mm-hmm. the quote is very simple. It's that hope is a discipline. And you know, in times where I see things being bleak or difficult, I bring myself back to that quote and understanding that, you know, hope isn't something that's meant to just be, you know, easy or to be given to me. It's something that I have to practice in terms of, you know, being able, being willing to be able to put in the work of envisioning that, you know, this thing is possible. This thing that I'm dreaming of, this goal that I'm looking to achieve, this way of being that I'm hoping for my folks to have in term, you know, is possible. Um, like, tra- like the CDU uh, mission, like part of the mission is uh, envisioning a society in which there's a uh, health equity for all. Um, and right. so folks might say that's unreasonable. They might say that, um, you know, um, you know, not logical, but it's like, we have to be able to practice hope as a discipline and aim for those things if we want to be able to even benefit slightly from what that reality could be, right? Yeah. Um, and so I, I take that in a lot, you know, practicing hope as a dis- discipline. Um, and if we're talking like practical stuff, like look for programs, look for mentors, um, you know, um, and don't be afraid to take time on this journey because, you know, however long it may take you at the end of the day, um, you know, if you feel called to this profession in this field, um, then it's worth it in terms of putting in the effort, um, even if it takes a little longer. So those will be the words I leave for folks. I, there's no better way to end this episode. Um, I, it's making me think a lot about um, just hope. I've never thought of hope in that way, but that's it's literally a perfect quote, short and sweet. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I just, I just want to say one, thank you, McKean, for just showing up and just being very just candid about um, medical school in general, like the journey of academia. Um, and then also leaving with these quotes where it's kind of like sprinkling seeds, I want to say, where it's like, you're kind of sprinkling seeds. And, um, I hope that people listen to this, they take the seeds and they water it in their brain and they kind of move, um, with those two quotes in their mind also, because I think that's just a really good way to just orient yourself and really kind of reflect on like where you're at where you want to go and then also like to quote what you just said just being a reasonable is cool like being a lot of the stuff that we have right now um was considered unreasonable a couple generations ago or a generation ago um so yeah i want to thank you so much um and also yeah i want to thank the folks who are listening thank you for tuning in and I will see you guys soon with our next speaker. Thank you so much, McKean. Thanks, Sarah. I appreciate you.